once she comes on. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking to you about an integrated approach to diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. And interestingly enough, when you think about the word STEM, you often think about STEM being an integrated term, science, technology, engineering, and math. But in this session, we're going to talk to you about why STEM is not just an integration of disciplines, but an integration of approaches to make certain that all students are included in STEM and see STEM as accessible to them. So first of all, what we'll do is we'll talk to you about what diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion mean as distinct terms. Um, but before we do that, we were wondering is if, in, if in the discussion box, you might write for us just quickly, how do you see those four terms as being different? Again, diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. When you do that, you can share with us. We'll see your name, of course, um, and your affiliation, perhaps. So the four terms are used in, in the field of STEM education, and each of them means something different. So first, diversity is all of the ways that people are different and the same whether it's at the individual level or whether it's at the group level. Equity is whether or not things are, you're, you're treating people fairly and you're giving them just treatment. And we're going to talk about the word just and justice later on in the discussion. Accessibility is a term that's often ignored when you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so we'll speak about what accessibility means as well. So Shalina, um, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Great to be with you today. Carol, thank you so much for having me as a part of this session. My name is Shalina Ramnarine. I work at Johnson & Johnson and more specifically Janssen Pharmaceuticals as a senior manager in Janssen Business Development, Diagnostics, and Emerging Technologies. Really looking forward to the conversation today. Yeah, thanks, Shalina. And Shalina, will we be able to share slides with them, do you think? Yes, are you able to see my screen? No. Okay. Just you. Okay. So we'll just keep going um, so that we can have a chance to, as you work on perhaps trying to be able to bring that up. Um, so in the chat box, Christine Royce, thanks Christine, defines accessibility as ensuring all students have the ability to get all the materials, resources, supplies needed. And that is really important because diversity, equity, accessibility, inclusion, we've got to make certain the A is included in there. So let's give you a, sec a second to take a look at um, the next slide, which gives you four different terms and four different definitions. And what we want you to try to do is try to match the term with the definition. And in the chat box, just simply pick one of them. You don't have to do all four. Pick one of them and just write down A and two or A and four to see whether or not you can match these terms with their definitions. So I'll give you a minute to do that. And maybe about 10 more seconds. All 
All right, so let's take a look um, at some of your responses before we go to the next slide. Um, so some of the things that you stated, so David said that B, equity, is the same as four, and that's correct. So this definition comes from the American Alliance for Museums and the American Alliance for Museums, of which the Smithsonian is a part, says that equity is about fair and just treatment of members. Um, uh, Jakarta said that D, inclusion, is the same as two, ensuring diverse individuals fully participate in all aspects of the work, including decision-making and engineering solutions. Sal said that C, accessibility, is the same as one, and that's correct. Giving equitable entry to everyone along a continuum of human ability level and experience. And finally, um, diversity, A, all the ways that people are different and the same at the individual and the group level. So A, three. So the next slide shows you that these terms as the American Alliance for Museums defines it are different from one another. They actually mean different things. And yet we have a tendency to use them as if they are synonymous one, with one another and they're not. You can ensure that your STEM workforce is diverse. In other words, D3, that all the ways that people are different and the same. So you have a group of individuals who have different demographic backgrounds. And yet you are not ensuring that you're including them in opportunities. You are not making certain that you're giving them fair and just treatment. You are not making certain that you're meeting them along their human ability or, or experience level. And so you can have diversity, but not have equity. You can have equity and not be inclusive. You can have inclusivity, but not be providing accessibility. So it's really important that you think about each of these terms in your STEM classroom and in your STEM workforce along all four of these very differently defined, but integrated terms. So in the next slide, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Shalina, and she's going to talk to you about why identity in STEM is important. Uh, Shalina? Thank you so much, Carol. So when we think about identity, I tend to think about specific identity markers, as I refer to them as, but it's really characteristics um, that can kind of shape your either background, your perception of life, the lens with which you view life through. So I was actually born in Trinidad and Tobago uh, in the Caribbean. So two of my identity markers are Trinidadian uh, and West Indian. I'm a female. I'm a geneticist by training. I have a PhD in genetics, um, so I'm a scientist. I consider myself an independent thinker, a community organizer. I'm an immigrant to America. Uh, when I moved to America, I grew up in Georgia, so I'm a southerner. Uh, I, people tend to say that I'm a, a deep thinker. I like to really kind of get into the mechanics of uh, something that I'm thinking about and I enjoy sort of pontificating, um, probably as a stereotypical scientist does. Um, I consider myself black. Um, so these are just some identity markers that I've put together. Um, and your identity map may be very different. Uh, the really, the the concept here and the foundation of how this connects to DEIA is thinking about how each of these identity markers shape our perception of the world around us and probably our, our views of, of what's reality, our norms, as we may think of them as. So I'd love for you guys to think about, you know, what are some identity markers um, that you would put on your identity map? So, Shalina, I'm going to try to share my screen if you want to bring yourself back, and I'll move the uh, slides forward for you. Okay, sounds good. And I want everybody to know as I do that, I've set up my PowerPoint slides so that it will provide a transcript of what I'm saying to you as I speak. This is a good example of accessibility. We have colleagues that we work with who do not, um, who are um, hearing impaired. And this would allow them to be, uh, we, would, we would meet them along their human ability level by using this automatic transcript. So this is something you can do in PowerPoint. Fantastic, Carol. Thank you so much for the example of how we can be more inclusive. 
Um, you, you can also have students make a physical identity map. So perhaps they can collect items that relate to their heritage or a trip they took that they felt like really shaped um, a part of who they are. The key here is just that these objects should represent um, significant characteristics that are important to you that influence your perception of life or how you may think about yourself. I think that there is no um, specific way in which an identity map or a physical identity map should look. It's all about representing the different components of your identity, which also kind of relates to this idea of intersectionality, right? So although I'm a woman because I'm a black woman, that may be a different experience for me than if I were a white woman or an Indian woman, for example. Being an immigrant gives me a different lens as if I were American. So I hope that illustrates kind of how identity markers and a physical identity map can influence, um, one, how you view the world, but also how you can use these things to really think more deeply about yourself and kind of your perceptions or your assumptions about the world potentially as well. Next slide, please, Carol. So we would really love if you could take this opportunity in the chat to think about, you know, what are certain aspects of your identity um, that are more influential than other aspects and why? Um, and while you're doing that, you know, I can share for me, I found that uh, when I was living in Trinidad, uh, being black uh, played a different role kind of in how I perceive my identity as it has uh, living in America, just as one example. Um, another thing that you consider is how might your identity map change over time? So if I did this exercise um, maybe five years ago, I may not have scientists on my map, but now I do. Uh, maybe now I would have pharmaceutical um, uh, executive, right? Uh, and I may not have had that a couple of years ago. So this can also change over time. Next, Carol. And how much control do you have over the things in your identity map? You know, there are sort of labels sometimes that are placed on us that we may or may not identify with. And so I think that's a really interesting um, exercise to think through. Next. How might your personal identity influence how you approach DE? DEAI and STEM. Um, and I spoke a little bit about this in terms of thinking about the lens, right? So uh, if you uh, maybe tend to be othered in certain ways, you may be a little bit more conscious sometimes of DEAI, um, but perhaps this could be a great exercise to think about the ways in which we may or may not be conscious of uh, ways to be more inclusive uh, to other groups that have different identity markers um, than we may, do, may have. Next Perfect. Time. So what I'm going to do now, Shalina, is I'm going to turn it back um, over to you to share your screen. Okay. And then I'll talk a little bit about why DEAI in STEM is important. So what we've done is we've defined DEAI, talked about our identity as being crucial to being able to understand why diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion is important. If we know in order to do any, I would say, any STEM unit of study that you engage in, the very first thing that you should do with your students is have them create an identity map because their identity matters in terms of how they view that particular scientific, engineering, technology, or mathematical approach. And so having students who you are first engaged with create an identity map, whether, as Shalina said, it is physical map or it is a, on a piece of paper, is really crucial to how they approach the topic. As we know, social emotional learning is something that should be integrated into all of your fields of study because it does make a difference in terms of how students, what perspective they take when they examine that particular science, technology, engineering, or math study. So why is DEA in STEM important? So as Shalina shows here, um, there's a lack of diversity in the STEM workforce. This slide, which is from the National Science Foundation, shows that scientists and engineers working in science and engineering occupations are not as diverse as they should be. The majority of the population of individuals who work in STEM fields are white, and almost 50% are white male. 
And yet when you look at the population overall, there is not a demographic match between the population and the STEM workforce demographics themselves. And as we know, having a diverse view, set of viewpoints in a room actually makes a difference. So the question is, as we are STEM educators and in the STEM workforce, many of us in the K through 12 undergraduate and graduate fields, we are preparing students to be STEM literate, to be scientifically literate, mathematically literate, et cetera. Those students may, if we're fortunate, go on to major in a STEM field. They may even be fortunate enough to go on to, re, um, to enter into a STEM career. But the challenge is that they're not persisting. So according to the American um, Institutes for Research, as well as, as Pew Research, who did a study that I was involved in in 2018, where they studied science, technology, engineering, and math to determine why the field is predominantly white male. Why is the field predominantly white? And what they found was that many, many people who are underrepresented in the field are not persisting. They are leaving the field. So one in six STEM PhD holders leaves STEM. Why? According to the Pew Research study that was released in 2018, people who are in minoritized groups who have an advanced degree, like our colleague Shalina, tend to feel as if they are not accepted in the field. They're passed on for their um, opportunities. Um, so they're not included in those opportunities, even though they are capable of and have the right skill set. One in five female STEM PhD holders leaves STEM. Why? Because they have two strikes against them. They are not only an advanced professional, but they are also someone who is in a minor minoritized group because they're female. And one in five black STEM PhD holders leave STEM. So this is a challenge. Persistence matters. And how do you shift persistence? You change the culture within the organization. So we have to start from kindergarten on to make certain that all students feel as if there is a diverse set of voices in the room, that they have equitable opportunities and just treatment, that they are included in these um, advancements and opportunities and that they are met along their human ability and experience. Shalina, did you wanna talk at all about your own experience in terms of whether or not this acceptance and field of, uh, and this ability of persistence makes a difference, especially as a black woman who has a PhD and advanced degree in a field in which probably the majority of your colleagues also have those advanced professional degrees. Yeah, absolutely, Carol. And I'm wondering while I do that, um, if you want to present kind of the next couple of slides um, so that people could read that, you know, in between listening to my story. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, I was born in Trinidad and Tobago. I moved to America at the age of 10. So I attended uh, fifth grade onward um, in America. And when I first came to America, I was actually getting ready to learn algebra because they're on the British system. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago. So, uh, and I wasn't used to regular tests because in Trinidad, you have kind of one big exam at the end of the year. So it's quite an adjustment for me um, in terms of, you know, getting tested more regularly um, and just kind of the, the flow and the mechanics of the American educational system. And in fifth grade, I went to a very diverse school and the top students um, in my grade were actually black. Um, so I felt really supported. In sixth grade onward, I actually went to a fine arts magnet school in Georgia, and this school is actually constructed um, to help with desegregation. So the school was supposed to be 45% white, 45% uh, black, um, and then 10% other category. So uh, because it was a fine arts magnet school, I had to dance, draw, act, sing, um, write a poem, you name it, uh, to kind of interview to get into the school. And so the school, uh, by that context, was very diverse uh, in some ways. Um, and uh, it was a very kind of like 
um, type A environment. So it was competitive in that sense. But we did have kind of diversity in the people that I saw every day in terms of my classmates. There were about 100 students. So it was very small. Um, I did not have many diverse teachers. I think I had one African-American male teacher who actually was a science teacher um, in the seventh grade, I believe. Um, and then I had an African-American female that taught anatomy in ninth grade. Um, my other teachers were uh, mostly white, a fair mix of men and women. Um, and I really uh, never felt uh, excluded by my teachers or, or felt like I couldn't do something. But I know that I went to a very high achieving school. So in general, there was always this narrative of, you know, you guys are at this school. It's one of the best schools in the state of Georgia. You're very capable. All of my classes were honors classes um, or AP classes. I started taking AP classes in the ninth grade. Um, so by the time I got ready for college, I already had like a semester and a half of college done. I think I had maybe 18 college credits. Um, so that really set me up very nicely. So I just want to acknowledge that a lot of ways in my background, I had a very privileged environment because I was in such a high achieving environment that there were never kind of any uh, overt or covert kind of messages um, towards my ability in that way. However, I will say that, you know, for me, race was kind of like a, a new concept um, when I came to America because Trinidad is, is kind of Indian and black. And I never really saw any, you know, white people when I was growing up uh, in Trinidad. So when I came to America and I started like, you know, meeting everybody and interacting with everyone, I noticed that many of the students that were in the top 10 of my class, there was only me and one other black woman. And so I was really curious about that. Like, you know, why weren't there other, my school is so diverse, you know, why weren't there other like black students that were like in the top ranks of my classes? Um, and I think part of that had to do with where they were pulling people from and the educational foundation that they had from like elementary school um, and how that kind of influenced them. So I just wanted to highlight that, you know, education really builds. Um, and so it's super important to make sure that students are getting the support that they need, not just from an emotional perspective, but also in terms of just getting the educational foundation to build um, to the next level. And I've also seen that because I um, volunteered um, to speak to some students in St. Louis, in North St. Louis, which is actually part of Illinois. And I was sharing a lecture on genetics um, and these students, you know, they didn't know about the XY chromosome and they were in 11th grade. And I was just thinking to myself, man, what chance do they have at college if they're already kind of behind in terms of, you know, this content, um, this type of information. So um, in that, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, I did come from a very diverse um, and supportive, high achieving um, environment. Um, and in that environment, I didn't receive a lot of messages about specifically my ability from teachers. Um, but I did also notice like there weren't a lot of students, you know, in uh, in the top 10 of my class. I also did science club and math club. And I remember going to a math competition and, you know, I was the only black person on a team. Um, I, in science club, there were some more uh, black people and there was a little bit more diversity. Um, but I still many times kind of felt isolated. Like, why am I the only, you know, person that looks like me um, in these environments? And uh, there were there was one time where, you know, one of my uh, fellow students, she was 11th and I had placed 10th. And she told me, oh, if I would have worked harder, I would have been 10th. Um, but I think because race was a new concept for me, I just like interpreted that as, you know, her issue. I didn't really understand like what that could mean for me racially. Um, and the reason why I'm so transparently kind of sharing my journey with race is to say, you know, now having went to graduate school, I was one of three black people in my PhD class out of 74. 
Um, and I saw, you know, what I represented to the janitors. I used to code uh, in graduate school, so I'd stay in lab all kinds of hours, and all the janitors would always come up and tell me, like, oh, we're so proud of you, you know, and there were many instances that happened that reminded me that I was, you know, a minority in my PhD program and that there weren't many Black PhDs. People would oftentimes mistake me for a staff. Um, and I saw kind of the mental and emotional toll that took on me um, at, at, you know, over the course of five years that I was there. Um, and now looking back on my early experiences, I realized that if I had interpreted these instances probably as racially related, it probably would have affected my self-esteem much more as I was developing. I didn't interpret it that way because I didn't have that context. Um, and my dad sometimes would try to educate me on race in America and I, I didn't understand it because it was such a foreign concept for me. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that, you know, even though students may not be getting direct messages from teachers, that doesn't mean that they aren't getting messages from their fellow students. And I think that's where the role of a teacher can be really important to like step in and, and you know, make sure that students getting that emotional support and feel that they have the same ability or capability um, as others. And then the last point I'll make is, you know, as you enter the workforce, so I had a PhD in genetics in the STEM field, um, and I chose not to go into coding. And honestly, it was because I felt like I have such a great personality and I didn't feel like my personality would be recognized if I went into that type of field. So when we think about the barriers, I think people want to be seen as a holistic people and not just kind of one dimensional. And so it's important to consider, like, what are the factors that are important for that person and why might this career be more attractive? Right. And so that's something that could have easily been solved with a culture change if somebody had that conversation with me and may have actually led to me going into uh, a coding type of career. Um, so I know I said a lot, but in summary, I think it's really important to consider what are the covert or sub um, uh, non-obvious messages that teachers may be sending about a student's ability. What are messages that students may be receiving from other students? How is kind of the environment and the expectations um, of performance for students set up to make them feel like they have the ability. Um, also, you know, how are students kind of dealing with that isolation and what is the role that a teacher can play in helping a student process or understand that isolation, feel like they have a partner. Um, and it really just uh, highlights the importance of listening. So thank you so much, Carol, for having me share, you know, that story and my educational journey. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that, Shalina. And if anything, I have to say, what you've just described is why that identity map exercise as a STEM teacher matters because your identity changed based on your context. So you may not have put down race or even a construct of race on an identity map that you created in your home country. But now that you're, you've moved to the U.S., that shifted. So students should remember that their identity is local, is personal, local, and global, and their identity may shift based on their context. And so that's a, a, a wonderful story. And I think it also um, leads us into this kind of next idea about, we just witnessed why STEM in diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion in the STEM workforce matter. And many of the things that Shalina talked about help us understand why what we do in the classroom also matters. So there is a problem in STEM classrooms. We know from the literature that Young girls tend to shy away from STEM. They see it as being agentic and not communal, being more masculine, and therefore believe it's not a field for them. Um, in high school and college, young women tend to avoid STEM majors or leave it permanently because they feel like, just as Shalina described, a misfit in the classroom. Persistence and resilience kept Shalina going, despite the fact that she was one of three out of 74 in a PhD program. Um, so we have to create those environments of resilience and persistence. African-American and Hispanic students also feel this. So the question that Shalina talked about, she spoke about her teachers. In the STEM classroom today, the ratio of teachers of color to students of color is way too low. It's even lower than it was in 1954. In 1954, we had one teacher of color for every 24 students of color. 
Today, one teacher of color for every 50 students of color. So there's an incredible disparity amongst the teacher demographic and the student demographic. And the research shows that that actually does make a difference. So as we saw, the DEAI, when we think about diversity, equity, accessibility, inclusion in the workforce, the STEM workforce, we have to include the STEM teaching workforce in that conversation. So the student teacher demographic match in the STEM workforce is completely mismatched. The student teacher matching effects actually make a difference. According to an article that was published in AERJ, the American Educational Research Journal, in 2019, Redding and his colleagues did a meta-analysis across multiple studies, and together those studies proved that black and brown students in particular, their student achievement, their belief in them, their, themselves, the number of um, kind of behavior challenges all improve when the student teacher demographic match is equal. So when a student can see him or herself in her, him or her, their teachers, then their academic achievement improves, their um, behavior improves, or their perceptions of the student's behavior from the teacher improves, and their belief in themselves. Now, Redding and his colleagues did not see the same results in the Latinx population. Um, and so the article is definitely worth reading. As, as Shalina mentioned, your mentors or teachers don't always have to be demographically matched, but the meta-analysis showed that that does actually make a difference in black and brown communities. So I'm gonna go back to Shalina very quickly to look at this identity map. And Shalina, just a very quick kind of highlight. I know we only have about, um, I believe we have about 15 minutes left because we started at 10, but if you could please um, just reflect back on your identity map. So when I think about, you know, what are some things that were really key to me in my identity map, you know, as I mentioned, I had to kind of understand, uh, you know, a new culture that I was walking into and what the perceptions of me were in that culture. Um, and so that was a little bit of a, a challenge for me. And, and when I look back, um, I think teachers just really treating me as an individual um, and, and being a listening ear, I, I think were really helpful in that. I had a lot of room to kind of explore, uh, especially in French club. I remember, you know, my, my teacher in, in French would introduce us to music and art and, and all of these things that, you know, really allowed me to kind of explore different cultures. And I think that that helped me understand my culture as well as, as, well as the new culture that I was coming into. Uh, I think my my passion for science and the foundation that I got in science really came from the strong science teachers that I had that they were genuinely curious in science themselves. And it really made me want to be an independent thinker um, and want to be a scientist myself. So, you know, I think what you see in your teachers and their passion for what they do is so important for students and is something that I think really sticks with students. Yeah. Thanks so much, Shalena. So now we're going to um, shift to talk about how we can ensure DEAI in STEM. Um, so, uh, you know, I think one of the primary things, shut off my screen for a second. What are some of the tactics that you can use, the strategies that you can use in your STEM classroom or even in your STEM workforce to make certain that um, you are addressing diversity, equity, accessibility, inclusion in the STEM field. So first of all, our colleagues um, who are at the Center for Universal Design and Education, they talk about universal design. You've probably heard the term inclusive design, which is a more recent term that seems to be replacing the term in universal design. Inclusive design or universal design means that in, instead of providing accommodations to an individual, you are actually being proactive in designing your environment, your physical environment, your emotional environment in a way that is inclusive of all. So I'll give you a good example, and this comes from the center. 
Um, you're asking students to engineer a solution to a problem where maybe you're working with students in high school and they're in an architectural class and they have to provide an entrance to a, to a building. That entrance to the building can either be a set of stairs with a ramp next to it for students who are handicapped, or you can build a ramp in which all individuals enter the building up the ramp so that they are all fully inclusive, not so that students who are physically able walk up the steps and those who are in a, a wheelchair have to use the ramp. That is not using inclusive design. So as a technology or engineering teacher, make certain that you're building inclusive design, universal design practices into your engineered solutions so that students are designing solutions to problems that are accessible to all and not just to those with whom they identify. And in the next slide, we're going to another potential solution is that we provide role models for students so that they can see themselves and others. As we shared with you, the teacher-student demographic match is not equal in the United States. As a result, um, what we're asking is that if that student-teacher demographic match does not exist, then find opportunities to provide role models to students, either by highlighting the stories of people like Shalina and how Shalina progressed through her STEM pipeline, or have them read about those role models, or bring them into places in which there's a very diverse workforce so that they can see those role models at work. Uh, many of our colleagues who are in this conference who come from different corporations are providing opportunities for employees to come into STEM classrooms so that students can see themselves in others. Uh, yesterday, I had a chance to listen to Tata Consultancy Services, so our good friend Lena. Um, we listened to our colleagues from Dell. Uh, they work with EIE, and they're bringing into school districts role models, employees who can provide those opportunities. Shalene and I work together under a Johnson & Johnson initiative called Why STEM 2D? Women in STEM, Manufacturing and Design. And in those programs, we are providing opportunities for students to see the successes of those who may look like them. So this slide basically says another strategy is make STEM socially relevant. By combining key pieces of science and social science education practices, including social emotional learning. Shalina talked about the story of how her French teacher would include different cultural aspects in her classroom. And those cultural aspects matter. And we'll be sharing a handout or resource with you later that shows you why, how you can embed into your STEM classroom opportunities for empowerment and agency equity and justice, open-mindedness and reflection, and that local, global interconnection where students have a chance to see their identity and how their identity shifts. Now, the terms equity and justice are actually terms that we've seen used in different ways. Um, Shalina, did you want to address the next two slides? Sure, absolutely. So I, I think this graphic is just so striking because you really get to understand these terms from a different perspective. So on the left here, you can see for uh, equality where everybody kind of gets equal opportunity. Um, and in, in theory, this sounds really good because, you know, everybody has a fair shot. But we have to remember history and the fact that history has kind of started people uh, at different levels. So here, history would be represented essentially by the heights of different people. So even though now everyone is getting the same opportunity, because of the history, everyone is not able to kind of access the same thing. And, and in this case, it would be to be able to see the game. So on the graphic of the right, you have kind of the concept of equity. So that's when we acknowledge, okay, historically such and such has happened. And so that's why this person is taller. And therefore we need to give the person that's shorter um, a different opportunity so that they can access um, 
you know, in this case, seeing the game, right? And so equity, I think, is a lot of, you know, what you hear about affirmative action or targeted programs that aim to um, supplement uh, some of the negative historical things that have happened for a specific group. So this really comes to light when I think about um, redlining uh, in the fact that, you know, some African-American families were unable to build wealth through buying houses in specific neighborhoods because of banks' practices of uh, not giving loans to African-American individuals in certain communities. That's just another example um, of this. Uh, and so you could think about equity and equality in this way. The concept of justice says, well, let's remove the fence completely so that we don't need to augment or supplement um, specific groups in any way. Now the systemic barrier of the fence is removed so everybody is able to see. Um, and so I hope that this, this illustration uh, provides a different perspective on these terms and exactly what they, they can mean. Um, and so, Carol, when we think about, you know, the key considerations of everything that we've been talking about, right, we spoke about the identity map, we spoke about intersectionality, you know, how these ideas can really come together to influence one's life, um, and especially your lens, you know, of the world. I, I really leave you all with these, you know, questions or takeaways, you know, what behaviors can you change towards an integrated DEAI approach in STEM? And how can you be an advocate for students? And I think the first part of that, as Carol mentioned, is doing your own identity map and thinking about how those identities have influenced you personally, um, as well as doing that for students. And I think that that creates a, a different perception of how best to be an advocate for them. It's really about listening, connecting on a deep level and modifying your behavior. You know, no one's perfect. No one knows all of the answers, um, but it's just a matter of intentionality and being conscious of these things and modifying um, as you see something come about. And empathy really here is so key because all of this is, is very uh, human and emotional. And I think without empathy, we, re we really can't um, get at the heart of this. Yeah, thanks so much, Shalena. Um, so we're going to um, end with a few resources for you. I mean, I really want to say a huge thank you to Shalena for providing those key considerations of an integrated STEM classroom, because she has experienced that as an individual, not in her, not only in her K through 12 um, STEM experience, but also in her undergraduate, graduate, and now as a PhD um, you know, professional in a STEM workforce. So three different resources that we want to leave you with that you'll, you can download, of course. The first is a playbook of DEAI strategies for diversifying the STEM teaching workforce. So this is a project that the Smithsonian is involved in in collaboration with Shell Oil Company, where we are we have designed for school systems, state education agencies, university partners, community partners, a strategy book that allows those um, individual organizations and school districts and state education agencies to map out plans for diversifying the STEM teaching workforce by improving the recruitment of a diverse workforce, um, the retention of that diverse workforce, and the promotion of those individual teachers in STEM into more advanced professions, whether they stay in the classroom as STEM teacher leaders or move into administrative positions. Um, we also, in this work, provide opportunities for school districts to come together free, all, everything is free, paid for out of this grant from Shell, we bring together physically, although it might be virtual in the spring, um, different teams made up of five different individuals from that school district who then create a logic model or action plan on how to um, uh, diversify their STEM teaching workforce. So I um, ask you to go to that website, download that, that playbook, and then also, in addition, um, look on our website for that event, which will happen either virtually or in person in the spring. Again, all fully paid for, you have to apply. Um, in addition, there are two resources that you might be interested in on the link that's at the bottom of this slide, which are white papers that the Smithsonian has developed, um, which focus on 
how do you address gender equity, not equality, as Shalina talked about. Those words are very different. But how do you provide gender equity in STEM education? And how do you make certain that you're teaching everyone? And then that teaching everyone white paper is around diversity, equity, accessibility, inclusion in a STEM classroom. And then the last resource, the last slide, is that we also have online resources through the Why STEM 2D project that I mentioned that Shalina and I are both a part of. This is the Women in STEM uh, Manufacturing and Design project. And there's a, a, series, a whole series of uh, resources that are downloadable resources for promoting girls and women in STEM, as well as um, webinars and online resources. And I think the last slide just provides you with um, a thanks, of course, to our, the generosity of our supporters. And then the last slide gives you Shalina and I's email addresses if you ever have any questions or are interested in any of the projects or resources that we talked about. So Kelly, thank you um, for giving us the opportunity uh, to participate in this uh, workshop. Thank you so much. That was really powerful. It was an amazing presentation. I'm going to put your emails in the chat session just to make sure that everybody has it. Uh, one of the things I love about uh, this 10 times platform is I love those little thumbs up and I hope you can see that you're getting a whole bunch of them. So it's great. Um, and again, you're always just full of such a wealth of information. So thank you so much. And it's just, again, I say it every time. It's just an honor and privilege to have, you know, you with us, Carol. And I really, you know, heartfelt there. I'm so glad um, that you yeah, expanded it and you had Shalina join us as well, too. So it's terrific. Thank yeah. you. Guys. Have a wonderful day. Great. Thank you.